uh, Matthew chapter 28 uh, uh, tells us to go into all the nation and, and make disciples and baptize them in the name of the Father, Son, and the Holy Ghost, which we know to be the saving name of Jesus Christ. And Luke 24, 47 said, that, um, you know, because Messiah uh, raised from the dead, therefore this gospel must be preached in all nations, beginning in Jerusalem, you're witnesses of these things, so forth. Acts 1 and 8, he tells us that you'll be witnesses to me, Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria, all the other most parts of the earth. So all four of those are different versions of the same great commission that Jesus gave right before he went back to heaven. That is our challenge, to obey every one of those four scriptures. Now, because our country is in a moral and philosophical state that now exists, it is far more challenging than ever to carry out the Great Commission, to promote and disseminate the gospel of Jesus Christ, and to make disciples. It's very hard to do that. It was much easier to build churches in the 50s and 60s and 70s, and in the 80s, uh, among us apostolic people, there was an explosion of church plants. And I mean, just so many of them. Bishop Riley started at the same time I did. My brother uh, 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 Tommy started at the same time. Uh, Ernest started at the same time. Bishop Swansea started at all the time. Bishop William Jones, all these great churches were raised up in the early 80s. It was a time that was conducive. But since then, the nation has made a radical turn away from Christianity. And now it's very difficult to build a church. And then you in this East Valley, you have a very particular challenge that I wasn't aware of until talking with your pastor yesterday when he made me aware of the extent to which this East Valley is absolutely a Mormon stronghold. Yes, church of Jesus Christ, Latter-day Saints are everywhere all over the season. They got the money, they got the real estate, they got the political power, they got the cultural influence, they got the whole thing. Touch your neighbor, tell them, we're going to do this anyway. 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 Amen. We're going to do it anyway. See? Because greater is he that's in us. So there are challenges. Because church growth and disciple making is more difficult than ever in our lifetime. It's vitally necessary that we as pastors and leaders of this fellowship study church growth on a continual basis. I want to ask you to take out a pen and underline those words. Study the matter on a continuous basis. We must study how to grow the church. We must consider, we must pray over it, we must ask God about it, we must master the techniques, we must study how to grow the church. It will not happen by accident. We cannot, I was talking to the pastor, uh, and he and I have had a wonderful amount of communication in these brief hours I've been in town, and he spoke about one pastor in this city, I wouldn't ever think about calling his name, who not only doesn't go out and evangelize, but he will not let the saints go out. He feels there's something wrong with going out and inviting people to be saved. He's not a part of this fellowship. He's part of another group. But he thinks there's something wrong with going out and inviting people to be saved. I'm very happy that this congregation I know of is a church that still, when the weather allows it, goes out and knocks on doors and invites people to come on, come on, give God a hand break. I'm glad about that. I'm glad that's in the DNA of this church. And it must be, Bishop Newman, in the culture of every church in this East Valley. We've got to be known as a people. We've got to be known when they see people come to the door, they can't imagine, they can't anticipate that it's a Jehovah's Witness. they got to think it's, it's one of the shield of faith. Come on, get down. We gotta take over in that and become the de facto door knockers uh, here in the things of God. So, but we must we must study the matter. What mu what may we do then to grow the church in this difficult eschatological hour? That is the subject of our consideration in this teaching today. All right, next paragraph. Making disciples is the very heart of the activity commonly known as church growth. It is a concept which requires definition. What then is church growth. Church growth is often called evangelism. It refers to the activity of declaring the good news, that is the gospel, to individuals who have not heard it or have not responded to it in times past. The activity that Jesus has called the church to do is to fill the earth with the story of God's love and of the salvation that he has made available to humanity. That is church growth. When we make more people aware of and committed to the gospel message. That's a functional definition of church growth. We are to reach more people and to always increase the number of individuals who understand the gospel and have made a commitment to live their lives 
based on the truths of the Judeo-Christian worldview that we know. I want you to look at that sentence again. I want you to underline some words in that sentence. Get your pen. We are to reach more, under, underline more people. And we are always to increase the number, underline increase the number of individuals who understand the gospel. Underline the word understand. And then who have made a commitment, underline the word commitment, to live their lives. Basically, that's what church growth is. More people, an increased number of folks who understand the gospel and not just understand it, but choose to act and live their lives based on what Jesus taught. Can you say an amen to that? Amen. That's what church growth is. Flip the page, please. All right. Somebody say more. More. Churches are expected to grow both numerically and qualitatively. It is always God's desire that the number of followers should continually increase. And then second to that, that the quality of the spiritual life of the followers should constantly improve. That's church growth that is both quantitative and qualitative. Isn't it remarkable that in Acts chapter 2 that Luke the writer noted that the number baptized was about 3,000 souls. In chapter 1 he tells us the number gathered in the upper room was about 120. In chapter 4 at the healing at the gate, beautiful, he told us about 5,000 were added to the church. I need you to touch it up to somebody. Tell them numbers matter. You should be concerned about the numbers in your church. Dear saints of God, you should not just let Pastor Locke and Pastor Hudson be the only one concerned about the numbers in the church. You ought to be looking around to see how many people are on the pathway. You ought to be looking around to see how many people were in Sunday morning service. You ought to be looking to see how many came. Come on here, somebody. Come on, help me. You ought to be looking to see how many people came to Bible study. Yes. Because every, in every soul is a soul. Yes. Every time somebody gets baptized, that's another soul. You know how much heaven is concerned about numbers? They rejoice if the report comes back that one got saved. Come on, come on, come on. Come on, one is a number. Come on, get somebody. All the angels need is a small number, and they get excited in heaven. See, so, so numbers matter. So, so we've got to get more people. And it doesn't matter where you're starting from. Pastor Locke's church is only three years old. So they don't have the number of people there in Tucson that you got here in Mesa. They, they were not gonna, that's not going to happen in no one year. But, but, but however many it is, every additional one is a reason to rejoice. And you ought to get excited if you come to church. If, if you come to church and nobody gets baptized that day, you ought to leave depressed. <laughs> I don't care how good the pastor preached and how long you shouted. You ought to walk out the door sad if somebody didn't get baptized. Come on, somebody here, give God praise. We've got to grow the church, and it's not going to happen by accident. It's going to happen because we work with God Amen. in a hostile environment. Look, look at the page. In the New Testament, there were many spiritual attacks against the early church in the book of Acts. There were religious attacks by the Sanhedrin, that's in Acts chapter 3 and 4, they took him to court for healing the man born lame. There was deception and lying among the members at Ananias and Sapphira trying to trick uh, Peter. There was confusion among the saints, fighting over the food, fighting over the bread between the Grecians and the Hebrews. There was overt persecution and physical attacks in chapter 7 when they killed Stephen just for preaching. There was imprisonment in chapter 12 when Herod arrested Simon Peter and threw the bishop in jail trying to please the Jews. But following every attack, the church responded by growing more rapidly than before. And I want you to know that every time the devil comes against you, God's going to give you a new anointing. Come on, give God. Whatever doesn't kill me makes me stronger. Come on, get somebody. Every attack that you survive qualifies you more to be used by God. Do you realize there's a price you pay for anointing? Yes. When you go through an attack and hold on to your faith, you come out with another testimony you didn't have before you went in. 
You got sick and almost died, and the Lord raised you. Now you got a Jehovah Rafika testimony. Come on, and you got you almost lost your property, and the Lord paid the bill at the last minute and stopped the foreclosure. Now you got a Jehovah Jireh. Come on here, somebody. Everything you go through qualifies you more. So David said in the Psalms, it is good for me that I've been afflicted. Yes. How many know we learn something when we survive? Yes. Yes, Go through the fiery furnace. I mean, of course, we hate fiery furnaces. There's nothing pleasant about a lion's den. Don't nobody want to go through that. What that won't say, nobody got time for that. We <laughs> got no time to go through all that. Lord, why are you putting me through that? I'm trying to teach you something. Come on, come on. I'm trying to give you a new anointing. I'm trying to give you a new revelation. So, 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 what doesn't destroy us makes us tougher. And we purchase. Paul said, don't mess with me. He said, I bear in my body the scars of my apostleship. Paul was, was let down over a wall and, and left in the sea and beat 39 stripes. Three times he went thing that God let him go through. Touch your neighbor telling me it just makes you stronger. So after every attack, the church responded by growing more rapidly than before. Luke records that and he shows us how the church grew. In Acts chapter 3, there were 3,000. Uh, in chapter 2, verse 41 at Pentecost, there were 3,000. And then at the end of chapter 2, the Lord added daily. And then when you get in Acts chapter 6, after they put deacons in place, the number of disciples multiplied greatly. And then here come 12 guys coming out of Jerusalem. Come on, some of y'all not here. Here come Paul coming down the Roman road and preaching Jesus and honey it wasn't long till even the emperor got saved. Come on, get God a hand right. And made Christianity the official religion of the Roman Empire. And then touch somebody tell them we're taking over in Jesus' name. I'm saying that to let you know that no matter how hostile the circumstances are, there's a power in the gospel that can conquer. Come on and give God a hand raise if you believe that churches can grow even in wicked America. If you believe churches can grow, come on and give God a praise for that. And so, so Luke is right. Luke said, so mightily grew the word of God and prevailed. And prevailed means just one. Now, what is Luke describing in that 19th chapter? He's describing what happened at Ephesus when the gospel really came in there. Paul came and he found believers, followers of John. He has some guys. Have y'all received the Holy Ghost? You're in the church, but it sure feels dead in here. And they said, well, we ain't never heard of no Holy Ghost. He said, oh, that's what your problem is. That's why you can't have praise God. And so he just, he just described to them the gospel of Jesus Christ, baptizing in Jesus' name, God filled them with the Holy Ghost. And then, and then the gospel began to take over at Ephesus. And what happens is that later it says that the people, the whole town started turning to Jesus. And the people came in, they brought all their witchcraft books, they brought all their palm reader books and all their tarot cards and everything. They made a big bonfire and they burned all their wish. Come on here somebody. I believe for revival in Mesa. Come on. I believe some of the, for a Holy Ghost bonfire in Mesa. They burned those things and then and that's what Luke is describing. Uh, after they burned all that witchcraft paraphernalia, Luke said, so mightily grew the word of God and prevailed. Do you all believe that there can be a great revival in this East Valley? Come on. We have to believe. Without faith, it's impossible to please God. Amen? So we have to believe it, but we have to study uh, these things and work with God, work with our pastors, work with our bishop. Amen? How many believe the future is very bright for the church of God in the East Valley? I, I, I see that. I guarantee you that God is saying that the future is very, very, very bright. So, uh, look in that next paragraph. So the New Testament church is starting off with 120 people because there was no church until Pentecost. Even though the disciples walked with Jesus for three and a half years all through the gospel, but the church begins in Acts chapter 2. Amen, somebody? When the Holy Ghost comes, that's when the church begins. So the church started off with the group in the upper room, 120, then 3,000 more were added, then another 5,000 were added in chapter 5, then multitudes were added in chapter 6, and finally Christianity simply prevailed in the Roman Empire, according to Acts 19 and 20, which we just quoted. Today, many estimates are that there are approximately 2.1 billion Christians in the world. Come on, give God a hand praise. From 120 to 2.1 billion. All right. Now, let me read the qualifying paragraph. I, uh, everything that I've given you is my own work, but this that's below, it has an asterisk because I took it off of wiki.com, off the internet. Uh, some research that I don't have the time to do so I just took it off the internet and I put it in here for you to see so I'm going to read it to you many sources mention the number 2.1 billion Christians in the world which is about one-third 
of the total population of the planet. But estimating numbers is fraught with difficulties. What is included among the definition of Christian is not necessarily agreed upon by many of the groups involved. The term Christian, in quotes, in its simplest definition, refers to a person who believes in Jesus Christ as God. All right. Drawing the line between Christian and those who belong to very various sects of Christianity is in fact problematic. Adding to this the fact that no one can really tell if a given individual is a Christian at heart or if they are just paying lip service to the name of Christ. This is impossible for any but God who sees the heart and who judges people. The numbers can be taken then as a best estimate of how many people identify with the Christian message in some way. However, it is now impossible to say with any certainty how many true Christians exist since while practicing Christians have been in decline in America and in the Western cultures, there is a recent surge in membership in parts of the West and in the East, the numbers of those who are becoming new Christians every day is astronomical. The church in China is exploding in growth. I've been to Africa. The churches in Africa, I've been to Africa where I've been in uh, prayer meetings at three o'clock in the morning. There are thousands of people in prayer at three o'clock in the morning. I've been in Seoul, Korea, uh, in a church uh, at, at three o'clock in the morning and there were like 3,000 people all on their face speaking in tongues. I'm not I'm talking about planning. I'm not talking about sleeping in a bed bowl. I'm talking about outstretched on my face before God. I was in one church in in Seoul, Korea, I preached in uh, the largest Methodist church in the world. But when you say Methodist in Korea, don't let that scare you, because over there, Methodists are filled with the Holy Ghost. I preached in that church on Sunday morning. I preached in three services. In every service, there were 10,000 people in every service. Philip, every seat in the place, they had, they had a different choir in every service and a different orchestra. Come on, y'all. Help me talk about church. In every service. And then when the man would make space, it wasn't this way. He said, okay, now it is time to pray in tongues. And 10,000 people would leap to their feet and start praying. Come on here, somebody. And get God in here right. Honey, ain't nothing wrong with the Holy Ghost. Come on, come on, come on. There's nothing wrong with the Holy Ghost. There's something wrong with America. There's nothing wrong with the gospel. There's nothing wrong with Jesus. There's nothing wrong with the Holy Ghost. There's something wrong with our cities. Amen? And we've got to fight because we're under... Uh, challenging circumstances but the gospel is still working and that's what uh, is true out of this statement that I pulled down off the internet I want you to know that what they're saying is true the growth of new Christians in the east eastern hemisphere is astronomical there's even revival coming to Europe of all places Europe was the deadest place on the planet spiritually but there's even revival breaking out in, in uh, Switzerland and other places like that there, there are now estimates of nearly a hundred million Christians in China compared with just 5,000 Christians back in the 1960s. And in South Korea, churches regularly have tens of thousands of members. In one church, a Yordo Full Gospel Church in Seoul, Korea, there are over 800,000 members who actually come to meetings on Sunday. They have 800,000 people. That church now has well more than a million people on its roll. That's a great church, Dr. Paul Young E. Cho. And these are Holy Ghost filled people. These are people that raise their hands and speak in tongues. This is not somebody who's got their name on a roster. Um, all right. Uh, so it is while it's difficult to give a definitive answer to the number of Christians in the world, uh, yet uh, the range is somewhere between two to three billion. Christianity still remains the most dominant religion in the world and is still growing at a astonishing rate. Touch you tell the church is still growing. Church is still growing. All right, go to the next page. I've got another about 20 minutes, so I want to pray with you before we close it. Uh, here are some points and observations that I make.